I'm going to talk about the developing evidence. It sounds really boring, doesn't it? Developing evidence in rich practice. It sounds typically university, dull sort of stuff. But hopefully, I'll show you that it, that it isn't. Yeah. The heart of the DEEP approach, this is the school I work for, the Wales School for Social Care Research. It was set up um, and it's funded by Welsh Government. And, and, and the heart of our philosophy is this, the idea of bringing um, four hearts together, policy, research, people and practice. And, what, and basically the heart's really important because again, emotion we think is really important. It's about caring and um, it's value, again, I'll talk about the values, but it's, it's a values driven approach. And it comes, to me, it goes back to the heart of social pedagogy, which goes back to Paolo Freire's one of my heroes he suggests that the key purpose of learning is to create a world in which it is easier to love. And that's really our motto, really. We're trying to create a loving world where we bring the research policy and we value all these diverse knowledges. But how do we bring these diverse knowledges together to, 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 to make the world a better place? So the principles of DEEP, it's appreciative, it's relationship-centred, it's values driven, and when I say values, very specifically values, it's around social justice, So, because we're working in social care, so we, we've got quite a strong, well-documented well values base. Mm -hmm. uh, valuing and including diverse knowledges, it's democratic. We use a lot of narrative, because what we find is people make sense through narrative, through stories, we're story-making animals. So a lot of people think in research it's around data and numbers, but there's a whole body of research around how people make sense through narrative. An emphasis on dialogue and social pedagogy, starting with what matters to participants. And this is the most important thing I think we focus on, is this concept of dialogue. Because people think, oh, dialogue, it's talking, it's sharing ideas. Rupert Hyam, who's been working with us, has this lovely definition of dialogue, responding to others as if they really matter and building dispositions to seek out value and learn from the differences between us. So go back to Rachel's thing, it's really good because dialogue says, I might have one perspective, you've got a different perspective, your perspective is as important as mine. So, and what we find is, I think research community has quite got a bit of empathy with service users and carers in social care, because in social care, Nobody listens to service users and carers often, and neither do they listen to research. So we've sort of we've got this sort of solidarity of, we've actually got some knowledge which we can bring into the mix, and that's what we've been trying to do, but we do it relationally, not by imposing or trying to be a clever clogs and say, we're researchers, we're really clever, we've got all the good knowledge, your knowledge doesn't count. So, so the five elements, and we did this lovely project funded by Joseph Rowntree Foundation over a couple of years. Josh and Gwali are one of the sites, six practice sites, five in Wales, one in Scotland, and we worked with older people, with um, uh, carers, family carers, with practitioners, with researchers, with managers, and we got together around tea and cake to really value and appreciate and learn from one another. And we tried to see how can we make the world of social care a better place, really. And what we found is there were five, and I won't go into these in detail, but there were five elements which are bleeding obvious, but often what we found is if you don't listen to these five things or address them, nothing will change. Because there's a lot of talk about evidence-based practice and, and there's loads of research that says it never happens. And what we think is it never happens because you don't address these five things. So the first, you must really value and empower people. We, we've had all that conversation and we're all mourning about that. Secondly, that this idea that you value and use a range of evidence. What is evidence? One of my favorite quotes from one of the researchers is, what counts as knowledge and whose knowledge counts? And in power relationships, it's often one person's knowledge dominates over another. What we do is hate that, really. We like to challenge that. So research might come along to a care home and say, I've got this little bit of knowledge. And they might say, well, that's a load of crap here. It doesn't work. You know what I mean? And we've got to listen. We've got to, you've got to listen to those different knowledges. That when you present knowledge, you don't bore people to death with PowerPoints or um, bullet points or policies or strategies. People make sense of the word through narrative, through the arts. So we've used a lot of working using poetics and using narrative story and all of these visual things that we, we found that really effective. So if you, you might take, I could give you examples, but um, where we have like a research message, you must create opportunities to, for older people to give as well as receive. And you can say that to people and they say, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. But they'll forget it. We did telephone interviews with people about the bullet points from research. And nobody remembered them. But then we turned them into narratives. And I got a lovely story of George, and we, who was in in Gwalia. He was um, he was a a man with dementia who was involved in the group. And he said um, at the start of the group, he said, "I don't know why you're involving me in this. Because of my age, because of my memory loss, because of my uselessness." So he felt his knowledge wasn't really important. And, and with George, what we found is we did some life story work with George and found out that he was a strong man, that he'd beat, um, he'd beat Jeff Capes, he'd pulled a double-decker bus with his teeth, he, um, he was on Blue Peter, he'd had all these things, and he had a photo, a, a bag of all his photos, and he wanted to make a story, a book of his life, and, and as we did it, we said, George, why did you become a strong man? Why did George become a strong man? Because he was being bullied at school. 
He was being bullied at school, exactly. So George was being bullied at school. And then what he said through our work, he said, I'd love to share my story with kids because, and, and that's what he did. And I've got, I'll show you quick, we run out of time. But he wrote a little book, The Memoirs of Strang the Strong. I'll read a little bit of it because it just shows you the power of narrative. I used to faint in school assemblies, but there you are. This is how life is. Sometimes the other boys made fun of me. It made me feel sad. So George goes on. He talks about all he does. And then he ends this little bit. He says, Now I'm sharing my memoirs with you, and I want you to know you can be whoever you want to be. You don't need to listen to those who say that you're weak. Strang says, stay strong. Isn't that lovely? And then we took this book into primary schools and the kids loved George's story. And George felt so good. And at a final conference, didn't he? He had a table with a little lamp and he was signing copies of his book and the Old People's Commissioner and the inspectors were all lying. It was just, a, and it's fabulous. But when we share George's story, everyone remembers George's story. And what we found is, the lovely magic is when stories, people can't resist stories, they get it under their defense systems. And when people, they got the story, they said, oh, that's, they could start to understand, oh, we've got to do things a bit differently, haven't we? But if I'd said, you must create opportunities for all to be able to give and not receive, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have had that impact. So that's the power of narrative. Watch, I've got four minutes, I'm doing. Talk and think well together. This is the most important thing we think, and it's something that doesn't happen. What we found in our research is people don't, we assume when we get a group of people together in a room, they talk well together. Human beings aren't actually very good at that, and, 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 and there's a lot of skill and, and work around how you do that properly. And that's where we've made the link with Cambridge University, who've done a lot of work on this. And then you must sort the things, a lot of Simon stuff, sort the things that get in the way. We found a lot of risk aversion, um, bureaucracy, and, and others, and that's the deep approach. So some of the techniques, and this is really helpful, I don't know if you know, we actually use practical techniques to get this forward. There's one called experience-based co-design, which um, comes out of health improvement, which says you can have a perfectly designed care pathway in a hospital, but it can be a disaster from an experience point of view. It might look good on paper, and what you need to do is capture the emotional touch points, the highs and the lows, So and, it's, and you use those narratives, you capture those narratives, and then using those narratives, you bring them from certain, and that's what Josh will talk, so I won't talk about that because Josh will go through it. The other one is this concept of exploratory talk, which again, I haven't got time to go into in 10 minutes, and interthink, and this idea of collective genius, that when you have a well-organized, a well-structured, a well-facilitated dialogue involving people, a group of very ordinary people can create genius solutions. There's something wonderful about collective knowledge. So, and Neil Mercer, who's based at Cambridge, does a lot of work on that. And one of the techniques we use is a thing called community of inquiry, which is a very structured approach to dialogue like a focus group or something, but instead of giving people questions to answer, you get them to generate their own questions, and then you have exploratory talk around the issues. And again, going back to Simon's stuff, I think you look at what we look out for, what are the values? You can say, in a, in a community of inquiry, anybody can say what they think, but you must always give a reason why, and the whole purpose, and the idea is to challenge one another, and if you say something, you must only build on what the last person said. You can't cut in with your own little or, and if you want to speak, you put your hand out, and you have to wait for the last person to speak to. So it's a very structured way of getting a, a, a collective dialogue going, and no one person dominates. So this is, I love this technique, and we've done it with older people, we've involved people with dementia, and managers, and when you use that technique, everyone gets their voice heard, don't they? It's, it's a nice two minutes from it, yeah. Most significant change I won't go into, because that's a, another dialogue. All of these are, t are basically techniques and, and methodologies around talking and using narrative and dialogue. Magic moment, tragic moment. Yeah, I won't go into this, but this is lovely. It is worth showing this. This is the power of a story. This is Josh, Lillian, at the start of the project. This is Josh and Lillian at the end of the project. I could give a big project report. What's the difference between the start of our project and the end of the project? The body language. The body language, is, they're much closer, aren't they? They're cutched up, and cutch became a bit of a theme for us around, because Josh did a lot of work with us around professional boundaries and how we changed them, because people actually wanted meaningful relationships in services. They've actually swapped places. There's a bit of a metaphor in that. Why would, what's the metaphor of swapping places? Well, in, at the start of it, if you look at Gwalia's policies, it's about what Josh can do for Lillian, but at the end of the project, it was more about what Lillian could do for Josh. What did Lillian do for Josh? Josh she knitted him a hat, which he lost, which he lost. <laughs> we, didn't tell, we don't normally tell anybody he lost. You can't say that outside this room. And it's got a little Welsh dragon on it. It's made of mohair wool. She took such pride in that. It was fabulous. That's a magic moment. Staff, when they see that, they go, bloody hell, that's good, isn't it? Quick, is that the end? Or the, the, just quickly, the tragic moment. This is another narrative about a cup of tea. What's a tragic moment about a cup of tea? 
for Lillian. She wasn't allowed to pour the cup of tea, that's it. Because the first day in the day centre, she said, they told me, I went to pour a cup of tea first next to me, and they said, you can't do that because of health and safety, you know, you mustn't. And she felt terrible. In terms of this experience-based co-design, she said, I feel that made me feel lousy, actually. And um, But again, the narrative, the story, tells, and, and that'll, I'll finish there. We've done a book about it. And just finally, creativity is so important, we found, and taking risks, this was a big thing. The Reverend Sandra wished she'd kept a closer eye on the creative banner making group. <laughs> Arise, O oh Lord. <laughs> but it's lovely, we use this. Again, we use humour, because humour's really good to challenge. When you want to challenge the managers, you don't want to make them say, oh, you're all full of bad rules. But we, when you show something like that, they go, oh, yeah, 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 I see. Because basically we say, when people experiment, they sometimes get things wrong. And isn't that marvellous when things go wrong? But that's when you want to have a focus on learning, not proving, improving, not proving. And that's why I don't like the performance agenda in development. That's it, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.